Hello, I am Emerson Collins. And I am not Del Shores. And you're watching the Del and Emerson Show. Straight talk. Real gay. <laughs> oh, hello everybody. Hi, Blake McIver. Hello, Emerson Collins from the other room. So obviously you can all tell this is not Del Shores. <laughs> Dell is working today. Don't worry. They did tests. They are socially distanced. They are wearing masks, but he's working on a fun project he'll tell you about when he can. And so I've asked Blake McIver to fill in as co-host from the other room of our apartment. <laughs> so I'm in the kitchen office and you are in the bedroom, the bedroom office. office. Yes. Yes. Making our one bedroom apartment feel much bigger than it is. Yes, it's like our Palm Springs studio, except um, every room is a studio. Right. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, and welcome on this Tuesday afternoon, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or on Periscope on Twitter. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Please share the broadcast with your friends as we take our journey through the LGBTQ news and nonsense of the last few days. I'm the nonsense. You'll do the news. Perfect. Um, although in life, it's sort of the other way around. Like Blake's the like good, serious, focused, and I'm the flaily. <laughs> Yay! Yes, but this is your show, so all the rules have changed. Um, they we did have requests more volume from Blake. Turn okay, it up. Great. Then I will turn myself up. Crank hopefully, it. Hopefully that will help. Um, how was your weekend? Oh, it was so good. I spent it with Emerson Collins. Be like, you know, blessing and a curse. We actually did, we did a really cool thing. We did a show. We did a cabaret on Saturday night um, for the Public Theater of San Antonio. They asked us to do a cabaret show uh, on Zoom. Uh, and it was very fun and very exciting. And it was the first incarnation of a show that we've been wanting to do for a long time uh, entitled I Dreamed a Dream Girl. Tell the we people did. why it's called that, Emerson. We did. So we've joked since we started dating um, that if we did a show together with the styles that we sing and the music that we like, um, I'm in the Les Mis world and he's in the Dream Girls world. And that led us to the I Dreamed a Dream Girl title. And the opening number was a mashup of I Dreamed a Dream and Dream Girls. Something that should not happen. Ever. But we did it anyway. And I loved it. Erica said, your show was amazing. I need more. Thank oh, you. More to come. And thank you for so many of you who did tune in. We really did have a blast and we're grateful to the Public Theater of San Antonio. So that was super fun. Um, I hope everyone else this weekend was good and the week is rolling along well. We also did a viewing. Oh, we did. A viewing of A Black is King on Disney Plus, Beyonce's new film that was spectacular. Um, I'm referring to it as the prequel to Lemonade. Sure. Because <laughs> it felt, it, you know, Lemonade is very much like rooted in the African-American experience. And this was very much rooted in the original African experience. Um, yes. It, it was brilliant. I also loved, uh, I mean, I had heard the music, obviously. It is the visual album. For those that don't know, it is the visual album of Beyonce's The Lion King, the gift album that came out back when the live action, well, live action, when the CG Lion King came out. <laughs> Um, it's a beautiful, visually stunning, exquisite sort of reimagining, reinterpretation of the entire Lion King story. But the thing that stuck out to me the most was how many other artists Beyonce featured in this. You know, a lot of, a lot of pop stars in our current world get sort of get into hot water every once in a while about like taking other people's ideas and concepts and repurposing them for their own. And Beyonce just gave so many artists a platform to be featured in this, uh, in this visual album. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And it was amazing seeing so many, like I was fascinated by the rappers, yes. um, by the black costume designers, the incredible black hairstylist. It was really, really impressive um, as an art piece and really entertaining as a viewer. So I loved it as well. It was spectacular. Check it out on Disney Plus. The um, also and so in the midst of like nonsensy news in the world, everyone. You know, Trump spent the weekend trying to ban TikTok and then maybe sort of changed his mind. The poor teens today had an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Can you imagine though if he actually did ban TikTok, the uproar that would happen? Well, it's like of all the things you can't accomplish, you know, like basic national testing standards and a national response plan to, you know, a pandemic that schools opened and one school in Georgia had 260 cases right away, I think. Um, but no, good. Let's worry about like 
you know, it's it clearly is because he's mad at them for ruining that rally. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's all about the Tulsa rally. It, he has not. He he. He probably doesn't even know what TikTok actually is or does. I mean, uh, I definitely barely, no idea. I barely know. I figured it out like a few months ago. Well, they called me an older white gay, um, so it is definitely meant for a younger generation. They did. They came for your TikTok. I mean, fair. I get it. I am now up to that in in their generation, an older white gay. <laughs> oh, the Zoomers. What will they well, we about? haven't had a guest on the show in a while, and with uh, with Blake being here, it was a great opportunity. So we have a very special guest joining us for the second half of the show. Yes. Tell us about him. Yes, uh, my friend Diedrich Bonner is a, a spectacular talent. Um, he is an actor, a singer, a songwriter. He is a um, director, a producer. He's he's really he can really do it all. And um, I'm super excited to share him with this show and uh, to talk about some of the things that he has been doing in quarantine and beyond because he has been ridiculously prolific for everything that's been going on. So we're excited yes. to chat with him about everything that is going on in his world. He's an amazing talent. If you don't know, you're in for a treat. Absolutely. And a wonderful human being. So you will enjoy that. We'll bring him in a little later in the show. And until then, we'll get on to what we usually do here, the LGBTQ news and nonsense. So first up, Wenger's Grocery Outlet, a discount supermarket in Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, put up a bigoted, anti-health, anti-science, conspiracy-laden sign, and then were shocked, just absolutely shocked at the response from angry customers. The sign told customers to respect patrons who wear masks for their health and respect patrons who refuse to wear masks for their health. Sure. Included a fake quote about coronavirus measures intending to tank Trump's reelection from AOC. There was a fake quote that went around and then claimed that wearing masks health professionals and construction workers use daily will cause high levels of carbon dioxide, which will result in low productivity. Then it went further off the rails saying, there are people who got COVID-19 and not all the others living in the same house got it. This proves that COVID-19 is not as contagious as the news media and many others have blown it up to be. Wait for it. A lot of these pe same people support LGBTQ. This lifestyle is a sin in God's eyes and spreads deadly diseases and sicknesses. Now, not as much disease and sickness as just wandering around with your COVID cough, but I digress. Um, and so obviously there was a protest by the community in response. Several groups came together wearing t-shirts and matching colors at each corner, forming a rainbow pride flag that stretched through the town. At the same time, cars flying Confederate flags circled the rally, revving their engines to drown out the speakers. Trevor Leon, a local said, I'm a gay man in central Pennsylvania who grew up here around here. It's hard. Some little gay kid growing up in central Pennsylvania is going to see this and see all the support and hopefully it's helped. The sign was removed and employees have started to wear masks. But it's one of those, like the amount of like incorrect information, like people getting wrong news, believing this is political and being a huge piece of why we are going to continue to be in this situation for months to come because of morons. And I have a great solution. Just pop an Altoid. I think their complaint is that your breath is nasty and that's why you don't like wearing a mask. That's my theory. I will say, I put on my mask the other day and was like, oh, I need to brush my teeth. You know, you get that like, it's close to your yep. face. And I was like, yep. ooh. Oh, bloop. I mean, I'm not getting close enough to talk to somebody else, but I definitely need to freshen it up for my <laughs> For <self."> yourself. <laughs> but it's also for, so frustrating to see people with small minds who aren't willing to believe scientists, who also are the same kind of people that carry racism, that carry homophobia, that carry transphobia, and to see that bigotry wrapped up into the health crisis, you know, demonstrates how it impacts marginalized communities in addition to being the most likely to get sickness spread. So these issues just compound upon each other. And how in Pennsylvania we got so quickly from like anti-mask to like Confederate flags showing up. Right, like those in things a state are related. It wasn't even part of the Confederacy. I just I, it, ugh. one it's of the dangers disgusting. of the two-party system. It's like each column gets a box. Oh, we're pro-Confederacy. Oh, we're pro-science. Oh, we're, you know, and and That's it just awesome. trickles on down. All right, up next. Uh, next Saturday night was uh, in in addition to our cabaret. It was the first virtual edition of Jerry Mitchell's annual striptease fundraiser, Broadway Bears, uh, that they entitled this year Zoom In. 
The broadcast featured previous stars of the show and choreographers introducing some of their favorite numbers, broadcast in full for the very first time. Now, Broadway Bears is an amazing, uh, amazing annual benefit for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS if you don't know about it. It started in 1992 in response to the HIV epidemic. Jerry Mitchell and six friends created the first Broadway Bears to raise money for BCEFA. In its first year, the event raised $8,000 and last year it brought in over $2 million. This is an amazing thing that he started literally with his castmates in the Will Rogers Follies at the time. They did it at Splash Bar in Chelsea and it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. If you don't know about BCEFA, it helps people with chronic health conditions receive food, medication, financial assistance, counseling, housing, and much, much more. They've been incredibly active during this pandemic, uh, raising and distributing funds. They're also supporting anti-racism efforts with grants to the Broadway Advocacy Coalition, the Bail Project, Color of Change, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. If you didn't see it, it's still up on YouTube, and it is sexy AF. You can watch it at broadwaycares.org slash bears2020. And also, the um, the ongoing strip -a -thon, which was normally, if you've seen the show before, it, it happened at the end of the show. There was a rotation where you could just give dollar bills to all your favorite dancers. Now they're doing it virtually. They've been doing it virtually for a few years, but now obviously this is the only way you can give money. So check it out. Um, the strip -a -thon, it's also at broadwaycares.org slash bears2020. Link right there. Yes! And, uh, you can give to these beautiful dancers and it's all for a great cause and it was a really really fun show there were some definite it, highlight favorites it was such a great show you know i've never been to the live show in new york and so every year there's clips obviously it's for a great cause but it's also like a hella hot to look at like these people who dance eight shows a week in nearly nothing so i mean it's a win 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 at jerry mitchell it was the most brilliant idea when he created it and they've raised so much money for so long. And so you can watch a little cheeky, not quite porn, literally cheeky. Very cheeky, uh, lots of cheeks. Uh, and donate to a good cause. And I do love that in response to the pandemic and to George Floyd's murder, uh, that they've expanded to supporting um, anti-racist causes specifically within the Broadway community and larger as we continue all to work to be anti-racist, to look at our environments, our communities, our industries, and make them really accountable and ourselves accountable. They, they just continue to do it right. Well, and Broadway and musical theater at large, I think a lot of times we think, oh, because we've been on the forefront of so many social issues that like there aren't any problems. But I think, you know, this, this, this new re, re assessing of what Black Lives Matter means is really hitting Broadway in a good way, in a way that we do need to reassess and we have a lot longer to go. We can talk about that a little bit later with Diedrich, um, but we re it's really great to see Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS doing, expanding their reach. Absolutely. And Ken said, those Broadway dancing boys must work out. Yes, I enjoy watching because I am never going to be willing to work that hard to look like that. I mean, Bless its heart, my my tiny frame is not meant to be like yours. <laughs> um, all right, up next, you know, we talked at length about the importance of the boss stock SCOTUS decision, right? That ruled people are entitled to protection from discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity under Title VII. Now that 6-3 ruling addressed the cases of two gay men we talked about and one trans woman, Amy Stevens, the funeral director, with Neil Gorsuch and John Roberts joining the four liberal justices. Now, a leak to CNN has said that the result could have been very different. There was early agreement on the cases of the two gay men, but Amy Stevens' case was much more contentious as some justices reportedly raised concerns related to religious interest and shared bathrooms, which had nothing to do with it, and questions how to provide anti-bias coverage to trans workers. Some justices suggested affirming the rights of LGB employees but punting Stevens and trans people back to the lower court. Liberal Justice Elena Kagan is credited by CNN with winning over Roberts and Gorsuch to get them into the majority on all three cases. So although the landmark Supreme Court decision has been celebrated, the opinion Gorsuch wrote has set up a future battle over whether religious freedom, excuse me, or religious freedom could provide an effective exemption from the discrimination protections as he emphasized the narrowness of the ruling on trans issues. And I wanted to mention that because it's great that the result was right, but what nearly happened is a really dangerous thing that can happen within our community, right? Um, saying it's too hard 
to fight on a trans issue. So let's stick to just a sexuality and an orientation issue and get what we can get done there. It's the issue many trans people, many marginalized people, many people of color and black people had with really pushing the marriage equality fight because they were saying healthcare, housing, employment are so much more important to our stability than marriage. That's such a like high, a princess privilege problem. Not that it's not important, um, but there was real concern at the time that putting all our eggs in the marriage basket was to the detriment of these other issues we needed to fight. And so I wanted to bring it up again to remind us that as white, cis, gay men, and as white people in the community, as gay men in the community, to show up in these fights for trans people, for black people, for other people of color, um, and not take the easy route to the low compromise victories, but to fight to ensure the victories for everyone in every way. Well, and I think it's really important to remember it's 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 that thing that like you and I have talked about a lot, where there are certain times in politics where it's appropriate to to sort of push the pendulum a little bit far, knowing that you're going to get further or to ask for the furthest thing so you can creep up a little bit. This is not one of those times. This is not the time to compromise, not within our community. We can't just say, oh, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll worry about the trans issue a little bit later because we need to get this through right now. Like, this is not the time for that. This is not one of those scenarios. And I think it's really important to remember that. Yep. Absolutely. So I loved the result, but I was like, oh my gosh, that thing that we talk about in our com community was literally a conversation among our nine Supreme Court justices. And it took Elena Kagan, according to the CNN report, to make sure that Amy Stevens and trans people were in that victory that's now being used by senators and congressmen to push against the military ban, to push for the Equality Act. Like, this is momentum. And that little decision within the decision, so important. All right. Uh, next up, and I'm very excited about this story, um, Gail Garcia Bernal, who I love, uh, has just closed a deal to play iconic gay wrestler Cassandro in a new biopic. Now, Cassandro is an exotico, a male wrestler who competes in drag, who went on to become an NWA World Featherweight and UWA World Lightweight Champion. It will be the true story of, true story of and we're, we've got photos for you. Yes, there is the real Cassandro and Gail. Um, it's the true story of Saul, and I'm going to butcher this, so I apologize. Armendiariz, I think. Uh, a gay amateur wrestler from El Paso who at age 18 quit school and started training for Lucha Libre. He began his career in 1988 as Mr. Romano. He abandoned that character take to take on the Exotico character of Baby Sharon, which I want to know more about Baby Sharon, but I hope that's Correct. Maybe, um, before ultimately becoming Cassandro. Named for, and I love this, named for a Tijuana brothel keeper, Cassandra, whom he appreciated. I live for that. Yes! Like, she was this queen, and he was like, yep, I'm I'm gonna make my character after her. He rose to international stardom as the Liberace of Lucha Libre, and in the process uh, upended not just the macho wrestling world, but also his own life. I'm so excited about Gail taking on this role and uh, just this story getting told, because what a fascinating story. I mean, look at Cassandro, like this icon. I was not familiar with him and I loved reading the story and I'm fascinated to see the movie and hear this journey. And it reminded me of, we just watched last week in Mucho Mucho Amor, oh. the, uh, the documentary about Walter Mercado. Um, and it feels like a similar vein in the sense of getting into a very public position and then blending masculine and feminine in a way that was so big and so famous that it was sort of outside of the norm or cultural judgments that the person might experience. Did anybody else at home watch Mucho Mucho More? I loved it. It was so fantastic. And it was actually, it was a little bit convicting for me because here you saw the full story. Well, I mean, a, a very full story of this guy's life. And it, it, for someone who could have been easily dismissed as a punchline, right? Like as a ridiculous figure, as a over-the-top personality. Um, and we got to see who the real person was, uh, inclusive of all of that. Not behind all of that, but but as a part of it. And it sort of, it, I don't know, it, it really spoke to me on how our, our just casual biases can sometimes like sometimes we can just dismiss someone as like oh they're ridiculous and it's like no give give everybody their due it was really Absolutely. it was really lovely and i i hope that this uh this film sort of gets to do the same thing and For in Cassandra. the hands of in the hands of gail garcia bernal who i love 
It's yes. Bounty. Hey, crank your volume again. Yep. Still getting up much lower than yours. So just oh, well. louder than you think. Okay. While I roll on. All right, up next, the white gay founder of the Facebook page LGB Trump, throw up in your mouth a little bit, Mark Hutt, has been arrested for a second time for defacing the Black Lives Matter mural painted on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan after the murder of George Floyd by police. The video shows him throwing red paint one time, then a second time he's seen crawling around on the mural, spreading white paint everywhere. Um, and I wanna show you because it's like, his bigotry is so sad. Like it just looks so sad when you see him like flailing around on the ground, like spreading his paint. Y'all see that? Like that's, look at him. He's just like, he threw a can and then just like flailing around trying to spread it out. Um, Not in front of Gucci. I know. <laughs> and so the Facebook page also posts anti-trans memes. That's not surprising given that he removed trans people from his acronym to make it Trump, um, one of that kind of bigot, and posted saying, Saturday I splashed red, Sunday I splashed white, and on Monday, dot, dot, dot. Said Mayor Bill de Blasio has ruined NYC and has put a target on the back of NYPD's finest. We need to stand up and take our country back. Hashtag blue lives matter. He has been charged with criminal mischief for doing it. But like, uh, that once again, take our country back from who? The other Americans who are saying that the country is not working for them, for black people who are saying we feel unsafe in our country, for people of color and marginalized people who say our country doesn't provide us the same opportunities you do. You wanna take it back from them? Shut the mm. fuck up. <laughs> I just love the irony of that he got arrested by the NYPD. Well, right. Everything on his thing is <laughs> Blue Lives Matter. I'm like, okay. And then it was the police who said, <laughs> yes. Um, and, but also, this is a reminder again. It goes back literally to what we were just talking about. Here is a white cis gay man um, ignoring trans people, ignoring black people, um, sitting in the privilege that he has because for lots of white gays, marriage equality was sort of the last stumbling block to regaining the privilege they had as white men in our culture. So it affords them the opportunity to go back and say, I'm fiscally conservative. I don't want to pay taxes to help other people. And I'm going to be a conservative because I don't have to care about anyone else because I got mine and went home. Yep. Fiscally conservative. If I never hear that expression again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> I know. It's what those people always say. I know. And when when everything was less insane, that seemed like, an, uh, like a sort of reasonable argument, even though I disagreed with it. Um, but now I just don't even understand how anyone can say that with a clear conscience. But And see, and part of the reason I'd rather pay it in taxes and make sure there are good government programs to run it is I don't want to rely on people's GoFundMe for health care. I don't want to have to show up in my neighborhood to rebuild somebody's house because it burned down. I, you know, I, like, I would like programs to exist so I can focus on my work. I mean, really, I'm a Democrat out of being, you know, selfish. Like, I want to <laughs> help but I don't want someone to need my help for their like basic needs to be met. Right. Let's all pitch into that pot together and make sure everyone's taken care of. There you go. All right, moving on. Moving on. Okay, this one's another fun one. Uh, obviously the upcoming election is important to all of us and Barbie herself is getting on board with the introduction of the Barbie 2020 campaign team. There are four dolls for a full team. The candidate, the campaign manager, the fundraiser, and the voter. Lisa McKnight from Mattel said, Since 1959, Barbie has championed girls and encouraged them to be leaders. With less than a third of elected leaders in the U.S. being women, and black women being even less represented in these positions, we designed the Barbie campaign team with a diverse set of dolls to show all girls that they can raise their voices. They've also provided online resources such as play ballots and other printable activities, including prompts for girls to write their own campaign speeches, which is so cute. Um, of course, Donald Trump Jr. decided to slam Barbie, tweeting, Voter Barbie must be a Democrat because she's already wearing an I Voted sticker and yet she's got another ballot in her hand. Blech. Mattel shot back, and I love this. Barbie is not and has never been affiliated with a political party. This doll set highlights a range of leadership roles to pique their interest in shaping the future and raise their voices from the podium to the polls. I love this. I love it so much too. And I do think it's important, you know, that like within the group, right? The candidate is the black doll. Like it's providing diversity. And as Ken Hartsfield just said, these Barbies are driving people crazy. And it's like, First of all, y'all, it's a doll. 
Right. Second of all, if your little boy wants to play with these dolls, he certainly can too. Um, I had a friend who made a short film that was huge on the LGBT film festival circuit a few years ago called Barbie Boy about a little boy playing with Barbies. And yes, so they can be for your boys or your girls. It'd be great for your little boys to play with girl candidates and girl campaign managers. Absolutely. I think this just speaks to an important reframing of culture and especially, uh, you know, looking at children's toys and the way that we stereotype and archetype in kids' toys and have historically. And if we can shift those things to just expand the thinking from a very young age, just to be exposed to different colors and different ideas you know that's gonna i i really do believe that those kind of things uh, contribute to less bullying on the playground i really do absolutely and getting kids engaged in civic responsibility at a young age is important i love they had them writing campaign speeches it reminds me of the time i was in the model united nations at the national young leaders conference and got to give a speech as the fake president <laughs> and how many minutes was that speech um a lot probably you know, I'm, I've never been one not to have something to say. <laughs> no. Um, all right. And then in other fun news, y'all, we've been talking about Hallmark bringing the gays and LGBT people to Christmas. Well, Lifetime is coming for it, too. This year, Lifetime will release its first ever Christmas movie centered on a gay romance, not just a gay character. This is after last year, their film Twinkle All the Way, which I appreciate the double entendre of that title that twink all the way featured a same-sex kiss head of programming amy winter said we're proud to announce one of our christmas movies will feature an lgbtq lead story because at lifetime the holidays truly are for everyone now y'all here's the plot of this movie i appreciate that it's exactly like all of their others the christmas setup will center on a gay new york lawyer named hugo who travels to wisconsin to spend the holidays with friends there, the mother of one of his friends decides to set Hugo up with Patrick, a Silicon Valley upstart who also happens to be Hugo's high school crush. Sparks fly between the pair until Hugo is offered a new job in London. Oh no! And must decide on his life priorities. No casting has been announced yet, but it's slated for release later this year. I love that that's the plot of every Christmas movie from Hallmark and uh, Lifetime. Living and working in the city is terrible. Move back to where you're from and be a lumberjack. And remember, you actually only ever wanted the simple life, not starring Nicole Richie and Carousel. <laughs> and I love that hot guys don't fall out of the sky in cities in these movies. They're <clears throat> on, they only exist in the wild. They only exist in those rural towns, all yes. the hot men. <laughs> I, I also hope that they do it the way people actually do it to us as gay men, is that I have another gay friend. Obviously, you will like him. He's the only other one I know, so y'all should be a couple, so it'll make my life better. Easier, yes, yes. <laughs> the ultimate the ultimate straight girl matchmaking uh, routine. But, jokes aside, we absolutely deserve our own cheesy, formulaic Christmas movies just like straight people get. Um, and yes, somebody just said, Rick, Rich just said, the two of you should head to Canada and audition. Rich, when I tell you if I could get in for the audition, oh. I mean, it would be thrilling to me to play the Silicon Valley upstart <laughs> who is home for the homo for the holidays. I want to write one about like like something like Don Don Argay Apparel, something yeah. in that about like a fashion designer and named Don. You know, yes, yes, named Don. Don's Gay Apparel. Yes, something like that. <laughs> I actually just want to play the like the quippy friend who's still in the city that's like, how's Wisconsin? Are you eating a lot of cheese? When are you coming back? I worry about you. Is there a signal? You met, what's this? He does what? No, silicate, no, honey, come home. Just come back. A role you were born to play. Correct. <laughs> All right, moving on. All right. Um, Canada's Drag Race, which we have been loving, loving, loving watching. Um, it might only be in its first season, but it's achieved a first ahead of the flagship series. The Pit Crew, for those of you who don't know, are the underwear-clad models used as eye candy in many of the challenges. A recent episode featured a matchmaking game, and model and activist Mina Gurges was the first model of size used on the show. When asked about why he wanted to be a part of the pit crew in the audition, he said, 
it, he said in part in an interview for Out, the pit crew has men whose bodies are deemed attractive and celebrated in our community. The pit crew is seen as the epitome of what's desirable and the body that every gay man should aspire to have at any cost. It's the toxic beauty standard that's sadly ingrained in our community. But me, having stretch marks, fat on my body, and love handles don't make me any less attractive, and I think it's so incredibly important to show that beauty doesn't look like one certain size, and that it comes in many shapes and sizes. I always think about what kind of bodies and messages I needed to see as a young gay kid who desperately hated his body in pursuit of that gay beauty ideal. It hurt me so much growing up, and I wanted to do something about it as I grew up and learned to be confident in my skin. And I love this. I think this is so fantastic. Um, the pit crew is a cheeky, fun, sexy device used in all of the uh, versions and incarnations and franchises of Drag Race. And I do think that this is something that needs to be re-examined because we, we aren't, it is not possible for all of us to look like the poster outside the gay bar. Yes. Well, and we, when we watched the episode, we noticed this. Like we said, look, a different kind of body in the room. And yes. the queens loved it. Everybody had a great time. And when we talk about changing how our community and our culture perceives beauty, one of the ways you change it is just showing different. You know, people will like and click on what they're used to seeing. But you include a bigger man in the group and say, look, this man's sexy as hell, too. Absolutely. You, you know, it's on us as the producers and the presenters and the entertainers to see other bodies. There was a full range of colors and having him there, you know, one, and it's great, but also like more, there's lots of like, get short guys, tall guys, big guys, littles. Like we change it by presenting it differently and examining our own, the way we've been trained to perceive only one thing is beautiful. If you start looking further, you notice that you like more. And that is such a, it is such a specific problem in our, in our gay male community, I think, specifically, yes. that, you know, that we have just sort of fed into this one idea of what hot and gay means. And there's, it's such a, it's so much wider and more diverse and lovely and more beautiful when you open your eyes to other possibilities. Yes. Um, Keep your volume up. Uh, I am. It's all the way up. I just Be don't up. scream. <laughs> Well, you have to. Dell and I usually yell at the people. I think that's I why they're surprised. All right, and before we get to our special guest, we have one more quick bonkers story. In absolutely random news, uh, someone booked Carol Baskin, Joe Exotic's big cat rescue nemesis, to do a cameo about Britney Spears. And it was worth whatever they paid for it. Um, okay, here's what she said. I'm going to try and do my best Carol Baskin. I don't I don't really have a lot of practice. Hey, all you around. cool cats and kittens. There, there it is. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's Carol Baskin of Big Cat Rescue. I just want to shout out to Britney Spears, who is being treated like a caged tiger at the moment in a legal conservatorship. It's not right. And I know something about conservatorships. Oh, my gosh. Once those things are in place, it's just nothing but a free-for-all for all these attorneys to just gobble up as much of the money as they can possibly get their greedy little grubby paws on. So, free Britney. She should be in the wild. And she should really be wary of others, especially those closest to her. Stay cool, cats. Free Britney. Like, what is this cameo? She should really be worried about the people around her? I mean... Carol went in deep in the Free Britney campaign. <laughs> it's like that, that that statement is like what I always say about, you know, the, the fairy tale Rapunzel. It's like, what, what are we teaching kids? Don't trust your mom because she might actually not be your mom and she might be trying to kill you and, and steal your youth from you. Yes, Tangle. <laughs> like, just like, be afraid of your parents. Uh, all right. Well, he is anyway. waiting patiently in the wings. But before we bring him in, I want to be, to be able to rave about him. Yes. Uh, for a minute. Tedrick Bonner is a genius musician and performer. And if you were to list out the hyphenates of all of the ways he works in the world of music, from singer, director, arranger, booker, musical theater performer, background singer, lead vocalist, benefit performer, virtual benefit performer, and arranger and director. I mean, he has sung and arranged on hundreds of albums and soundtracks and commercials, and he just did the arrangements for a little band out of the K-pop world you might have heard of, BTS. Only the biggest group literally in the world. On the planet right now. <laughs> 
Um, and in 2013, he founded a group called the Singers of Soul. And before we bring him in, let me see if I can make this work. But they just did a virtual concert of hope um, that will lift your spirits. I'll put the link up later so you can all watch it back later. But I want to bring him in with a little clip of this uh, so you can see and enjoy the kind of joy that he brings to our world. So, Blake, tell me if it plays. All right. I can see it. Yeah. To enjoy the rest of it, you will need to watch the entire concert in full. But ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the show, Diedrich Bonner. Woo! Yes! What is, y'all better have that clip ready. <laughs> y'all better here, have it ready. Look, we promote the work. You worked so hard to put it out there, we share the joy. Okay, y'all are not playing, y'all are professional, okay? <laughs> All stuck in our homes. How are you, sir? How are I, you? I am doing well. You know, just taking it one day at a time. That's all we can do is literally take it. If you try to think ahead, like, oh, what am I going to do in three, four months? You drop yourself insane. So it I am blessed true. to be alive, healthy, and well. And I, that's all I will take at this moment in time. Amen. So, yes. Period. Period. Okay. But in that... You've been really busy at home. Uh, you know, I've been trying. Uh, you know, I, I, I do what I can. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm let's a hustle start, baby. I'm a hustle uh, baby. So let's start I back will. at the beginning. You're uh, originally from Alabama. Yes, I am. Come on, Alabama. Hey, I'm a country Fitting boy. Fitting well into our southern world. Yes. yes yeah, I know. <laughs> All the southern boys. I love it. <laughs> and what took you on the road to singing? Um, well, my mother actually and my grandmother were both the ministers of music at our family church back in Alabama. We have a um, church called Washington Temple, which is, which my great grandfather started because my family name is Washington, and uh, we have a church called Washington Temple. And my grandmother, my great grandmother, was the music director, and then my grandmother was the music director, and then my mother was the music director. So as soon as you could pretty much stand up and see above the pew, you know, your little eye looking. <laughs> You were singing in church. And so I just grew up singing I, to my mother, singing every morning, baking biscuits. Mm. And so um, that's how I got acquainted with music. But the interesting thing, I always thought that I would be more of a musician because my mother played the piano. And so I then learned the piano because I wanted to play the piano because in my household, my mother and my sister were the singers. And you know, not S I N G E R S, capital A, -A N. A. Okay. And Wait, that's like our house. In our house, Blake is the singer, uh -huh. and, I, <laughs> and the singer. Right, right. See, exactly. That's how it was in my house. So I never, I never really would sing. I would just sing in the choir, but never any solos or anything. And it just so happened one day that my sister was sick, and we were at a guest church singing a song called No Weapon Formed Against Me Shall Prosper. And my sister was sick, and I said, my mom was like, oh, I can sing it. I know it. And my mom was like... <laughs> Okay, so then I sang it, and then she was like, <laughs> and from then on, I had to sing every solo at every church. Had to. Yeah, had to. That was had that, to. I, yeah, well, with my mother, you had to. Even if I, <laughs> even if no I was saying no, <laughs> no, that was no, no. I it's, even to this day, if I go home, you gotta sing. Be ready. The Bible says, "Be ye ready." Oh my. <laughs> Oh, at all times, <laughs> at any hour. Well, you will not know the day, the hour, or the okay. place. Okay, that, that part, that part. <laughs> but I need to say, that's what started my whole uh, Viking and want for singing. Of course, I then went and studied collegially and then moved out to LA in September of 2009. Wow. Oh my God, I can't believe it's been gosh, that long. I can't, I can't believe it's been like that long. Right. We met, we met the first, gosh, the first couple, year, the, couple months you were in Literally the first time, yeah, which is crazy to think about. How did you two encounter each other? I I love telling this story because uh -huh. uh, I was t I was working uh, for a theater company <gasps> I and I was hired to be the vocal coach for this <laughs> workshop. And 
Let me tell you, there were some people that came through that door that, bless their hearts, needed the coaching. And then this one came in <laughs> to coach with me. And he opened his mouth, and I made the same face that his mother made yeah. when he sang that first solo in the church. And I said, first of all, I kicked him out of the room. I said, get out. I said, get out of my coaching room. Get out. And he was like, what? And I was like, you can't learn a damn thing from me. If anything, I can learn some things from you. So let's sing together. Oh, my God. I forgot. Yeah, that is insane. You are absolutely correct. And we've been friends ever since. Yes. Come and on. And then... And then what was the next piece? You know, I know, but I'm just fascinated by like the fact you have toured with people, you have worked at Disney, you have mm -hmm. worked all over the world. You know, what inspires you to be engaged in so many different kinds of music? Um, I think what it, one, I do have a love, obviously a love and appreciation for music, but I had a mentor when I was, um, when I first moved out here, just a little backstory before I met my mentor. I um, lost my voice when I was in college and um, due to vocal issues that were unbeknownst to me. And then at that point, you know, like lost my scholarship for, because you know, if you lose your voice then they could be praising you one day and then the next day after it's gone, they're like, all right, deuces, we're giving your money to somebody else. So then I, then I studied myself vocal pedagogy on how to, after I had the surgery, to maneuver my voice to get it back to a level that I felt comfortable. Who knew that would be such a blessing because it then gave me this crazy range to allow me to do so much. But in that, in learning from losing my voice, I said, I need to learn if I still want to do music, every facet of music, so that I am knowledgeable in all facets of music so that I could still be working, even if it's not using my voice. I could be playing the piano, arranging, writing, all those sorts of things. So I had that in the back of my mind before I moved to Los Angeles. And then I had a mentor who told me, I was like, my first, it was my first year out here, and who, I was doing a cab, uh, cabaret competition called, God, what was uh, um Oh, what was it called? Cabaret Idol. It was called Cabaret Idol. I don't know if you guys remember this. Back I do in the day, remember that. I do with remember Jane, that. With James yeah. Mooney, James Mooney producing it. And we were the first season of that Cabaret Idol. And one of the guest judges was Ken Page. And um, that particular day, I sung Feeling Good. And he came up to me and he was like, you have a beautiful instrument. He said, I can see my, a lot of myself in you. Like you're the younger version of me. And he was like, I will tell you this. He said, always, to, if it's a gig, surround it with music, even if it's not you singing, take the opportunity because you never know what your passion's going to be. He said, right now, I'm sure you think you want to be a solo artist, but who knows what your calling's going to be. So if it's an opportunity surrounding music, take it. And because of that, I discovered so many different worlds. I had no idea I loved background singing. I had no idea I loved, I loved the behind the scenes so much and that's one of the reasons why i then kind of have my hand in every pot honey i'm greedy honey yes. every well, pot no so not, I like it's my not hands greedy in. it's multifaceted <laughs> yeah so and you know it's funny that you say that because that's my story too right i mean i didn't move mm -hmm. to los angeles to produce three movies in a series and theater. you know i i'm still waiting for the lightning to strike and give me my tv show that i could yeah. see on for seven years uh, okay but, but in what all of all artists do, there's the lightning strike that makes just doing the thing a lifelong mm -hmm. career. But the vast majority of the rest is working and and gigging and pounding mm -hmm. payment and finding ways to be working around and in and through what you love. Right. If you put the ego of I want to be the star aside, you can always work. And always be working. That's why mm -hmm. you're always doing 74 projects at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> It's so true. Uh, the facts are facts, America. And it's such a blessing. It really is such a blessing. It really, really, what is, really was is. Was it a surprise to discover you had that ability too to juggle all of that? Or did you know that growing up through school? Um, I've always been an independent thinker and a go-getter. And I, I'm, it's the Virgo in me. You know, I'm like, I will figure it out. Or go, go, go. Yes, exactly. I'm like, I will figure it out. And I remember I would have all this adversity because I was the nerd in high school. So like I was student body president and like president of the AP club. So we had to plan certain things. And so I would always make them over the top, but at the same time have this balance between my school life, you know, um, family life. And then what I deemed at that point, my career with the school and doing all these things. And so I always was able to balance 
Um, but I had no idea that I could do it at this level. And I remember my mother told me that all, all five of her kids have a very specific, specific and unique gift. And she said, mine was the gift of favor. Didn't understand it growing up. And my mom would always say, you are blessed with favor. It doesn't matter what you do. You're going to walk into places and people are going to love you. You're not going to know why you're not. And so, and my, all my life, I've been blessed to meet some amazing people. Of course, people are going to love and hate you regardless of what you do. But I will say in my journey, I've been blessed to meet some of the most amazing people that have trusted me, even when I didn't even trust myself with the opportunity. And I realized now that's what she meant by me having favor. I was able to, you know, by word of mouth, like for instance, the Old Navy commercial, this is a multi-billion dollar company and they have invested every in me producing their holiday commercial, which is the largest one of the year. Uh, like everything from casting to writing the jingle to me being an actor in the commercial. And it's like their team obviously didn't know me. It was just word of mouth. But when they met me in person, they trusted me enough to be like, this is what we're doing. And the director of the commercial was a director for Greatest Showman. And he would look at me and be like, what do you think we should do? I'm like, okay, well, let's do this. I have so, a thought. <laughs> right. And so I think um, to answer your question, I did not know that I would be able to do so much and still keep a balance. But at the same time, I feel like my life groomed me so that I could be able to do it and also be a blessing to the, those around me. That's the one thing I love the most is that I get to give opportunities to my friends who are so deserving because there's so many talented of people out here. So I'm like, of course, if I'm casting something, I'm going to call my friends because I trust them. And at the same time, if they're on set and they messing up, be like, bitch, get your together, yeah. you know? So, mm -hmm. need to say, that was a long-winded answer to your question. No, I love that. I feel like it's so important for people to hear those kind of things. You know, that it's not just, oh, suddenly I'm doing great things. That it was yeah, no. lots of pounding and lots of mm -hmm. hustling and lots of building friendships, not networking, building friendships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Our that provides opportunity. Absolutely, because the thing is, people always say it's all about, you know, Ellie. It's all about who you know. I don't, I don't care if Oprah Winfrey knows you. If you ain't got nothing to offer, she ain't gonna be calling you for nothing, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're gonna be sitting at home twiddling your thumbs. But if you have, but in the in that same instance, if you have worked and grinded and built up a reputation where people can trust you, they know that you're gonna bring a phenomenal product, show up on time, and give them something great. Then if Oprah's casting something and she knows you, she's like, oh, I know that they're going to deliver. So then they'll call you. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's, it's not just who you know, it's how you do. Oh, say it again. You better make that a t-shirt. <laughs> like I know that was a new one. I've never said that, that before. Was but new. That was okay. new. You. you better write that down, America. <laughs> but it is, but it is that it, it's, it's like, it's how you behave and it's not about mm -hmm. building relationships to use them. It's about connecting with people you enjoy working with. And you do mm -hmm. that better than anyone I've known. I mean, like mm -hmm. your web of wonderful mm -hmm. people expands, <laughs> you know, through so many communities, kinds mm -hmm. of communities, kinds mm -hmm. of artists, um, mm -hmm. that is really inspiring. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Cause I really, I was in this quarantine. All you got to do is sit back and reminisce on things. And, <laughs> and I realized that I, so many times we as artists, we are so um, focused on the next gig. Cause it doesn't matter what level you are in this business. You will always be focusing on the next gig and worrying about the next check and the next opportunity. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Um, yeah. So the one thing that is interesting that I, what see, I lost my train of thought when I was thinking about going to the next thing. Oh, but we as artists, we're always focusing on the next thing and we sometimes forget to live in the now. And what I've been able to do with quarantine is just go back and look through the amazing blessings that I have and things that I've done that I'm like, wow, that is insane. Like that actually happened. And I got to do it with friends. It's like, it's so, 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 so cool. And so I am extremely blessed and very, Happy and glad. Period. <laughs> Period. The, um, now, I, <clears throat> you oh, have worked God. with a ton of known names and recognizable mm -hmm. entities mm -hmm. through the years. How, but this BTS experience is definitely a more random <laughs> option. Let's talk about how that came about and Baby. what the reason, their fans are passionate. <laughs> the understatement of the century. <laughs> That fandom, that they're called the Army. I don't want to yeah. admit, just in case they're watching, they are called the Army is strong, and they know. So 
th- and that's exactly what I, was, what I what I was speaking of earlier. Um, so BTS, they wanted to do an album. They were very, they loved what Beyonce did with Homecoming, that whole marching band field. BTS was trying to cross over, and they obviously are extremely successful, but they were wanting to find a way to cross over more into the U.S. market and create a sound that is more marketable, not only you know worldwide, but here in the mainly focused on the U.S. So they reached out to um, producers here in the U.S. that they enjoyed working with, one of which being my friend Dwayne. And um, they were like, we're looking for this like cool sound. All they said was they wanted, you know, we want a marching band sound with a choir. My friend Dwayne, all he heard was choir and arranging and they wanted a soulful soulful sound. So then he reached out to me. He was like, hey, I got this project that I'm working on. He was like, I'm, I'm in, the pro- in the process of negotiating, but I, I think you and I would be a great fit. He didn't tell me what it was. And he was like, are you around Thanks. are you going home for Thanksgiving? Because it was during Thanksgiving. And I was like, yeah, I'll be here. And um, what are you looking for? Can you give me a little more? Details. It was like, well, it'd be more arranging for a choir, and I think they want a choir on the track. But I'm just working out things. Regardless, I would love to work with you. And I was like, yeah, count me in. And then, like three days later, he was like, by the way, they it's a go. It's with BTS, and I was like, behind the scenes, B- BTS. <laughs> All right. I was like, who, who BTS? And and then and then I actually said it to my nieces, and they were like, oh my god. And so then I googled, and I was like, oh. Biggest band in the world. Oh, literally yeah. the biggest band in the world right now. Yeah. And so with that, um, initially, and here, and this is why I say you always got to make sure you're on your A game and just always thinking of being creative and coming up. And I always walk into the room. They'll give me an assignment. I will walk into the room and do 10 assignments and give them options. So then they know that, one, I didn't come to play. I came to slay. And two... For me, it's not about getting booked, it's about getting rebooked. So if you don't wanna work with me again after I've done a job, then I didn't do my job. Need to say, they sent me, initially I was supposed to help arrange one song. Of course, I came up with ideas for like six songs um, that were on the album. You know, they sent me scratch tracks. And so um, I, uh, and even taught them to the choir. We have rehearsal, arranged songs. And of course, when we get to the studio, they end up wanting us on five tracks as opposed to the one which also is an in payday, you know, for my singers as well, because, you know, the rate then goes up because you're now doing five songs. And um, it was just such a fun collaboration working with the Korean producers and the American producers and us just working together and be- having to think on the spot. Because I remember we were coming to the the close of the evening and they, they had this one little section. They was like, we had this dance break that we really don't know what to do, but we think we're going to add something. I said, let me hear it. And I literally went in the corner, did this, heard it once. And by the grace of God, something came to me like that. And I was yeah. like, how about this? So then I sang it back to them. And I was like, and we can do it in three part harm. They was like, sold. And then they end up using that for their single track that is now the number one album literally in the world right now. Yes. So, which, and it, it was so random. It was, but it was, again you building a reputation for yourself and then people trusting you with these mega projects because they knew you can deliver and also in a timely fashion and so yes and the two of you have sung together a lot yes we have this is one of my favorite singing partners (laughs) Mm -hmm. well and i think what you just said uh is really a testament to like the preparedness thing that you were talking about. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's why we love working together because we prepare mm-hmm. very similarly. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's like, there, there is, it's that trust thing of, you know, you know that the other person is so ready for whatever that right. I never, I never feel anything but joy when we're singing together, but mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's a collaboration and it's just a free expression because we know the training is there, the technique is there. And it's just that, so from there we can just play and have fun mm-hmm. and, and create something and discover things. Cause I, that's, right. that's one of my favorite things about working with you is discovering things that I never would have thought of. Mm-hmm. On I'm one of the, I'm one of those singers. I love to push everyone be like, Oh, we go, we, you go sing as high as you can and low as you can and we're gonna make this work because because i i am i'm so blessed to know some of the most talented people in the world around me like you guys and so i never forget me and blake remember we were doing a gig and we were driving to the gig and i was initially supposed to sing a song as a solo 
And I, I was riding in the car with Blake and our friend um, Aaron, and I said, well, I need to make the song a trio. And literally in the car, which was only like a 30 minute ride, we came up with a trio because I trusted them. Blake came up with a cool part, and the song was phenomenal. <laughs> That we then had to then do it again at the Christmas. And now that's our it. that's our arrangement of the song. Okay. It was all okay. in a in a car on the way to Santa Clarita. <laughs> okay, and it was fire. And that's when you trust the people you're around, and you and that's the thing as as a as a um, person who you know hires out talent a lot. And the reason I go with my friends because I trust them. I have to trust that when you get in the studio, you will do what you are called to do. I can't baby you. I can't. Yeah. Um, you need to come at the, and all my friends come at the same level at things that I come at them. And that's hard, loud, bold, and strong. And so, and that. that's, okay, and that's why I love <laughs> Blake, because he comes hard every time. Okay, <laughs> period. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and, and related to like the world as it is right now, you know, being at the intersection of so many communities, you know, the church community, of the black community, of the gay community, as a large man, mm -hmm. you know, making space for yourself in this industry. Do you find people, you know, what do you find there? Is it, I mean, so for me, you walk in with joy and presence and I watch people open to that, but on the mm -hmm. inside of that, is that a conscious decision? Um, it, it, yeah, I, I've always said you get way more with honey than you do vinegar. So I've always been a jovial person just in life. Um, yes, things have happened in my life that would knock any person down. But I always said, if I was always able to land on my feet, um, any room I walk into, no one in that room has done anything to me. So I'm going to enter it with as much positivity that I can. And it hurts no one to just put a smile on your face. And walking in with a smile, even to people who I know wanted my failure before I even entered the room, had no choice but to change their tune. Cause they're like, damn, I really wanted to not like you. But, <laughs> but you walked yeah. in with that smile and here we are working together and it's people I've worked with for years. But I, of course there's been issues with my statue, with my skin color. Cause when it especially comes to when it's being a stage actor or an actor in front of the screen, there are issues that it just, that I inevitably I, I've had to face, but all the same time behind the camera, there's been issues I've had to face. I'll never forget, I was helping produce a show for Fox and this was a huge producer I was working under. I'm not gonna say their name. Um, they're affiliated with the Oprah show and The View. You can figure out who that is. Um, but I'll never forget this person said to me, as we were wrapping the show, after we had shot 26 episodes, he leaned over and said to me, isn't it nice to be allowed in the room. He said, you'll never have a seat at the table, but isn't it nice for you to be allowed in the room to be a black man? And I was like, <sighs> You were like, nope, I'm gonna run the rooms. Yeah, Baby, I said, I don't need a table because I'm gonna build my own table. There you go. Correct, and mm -hmm. you have, and I wanna say, you know, first, thank you so much for joining us today. Of I find course. you inspiring as an artist. I find you inspiring as a person. And the world you build around you filled with people of all sexualities, of all gender identities, of all colors, like it is a natural thing built around you mm -hmm. because of who you are. And it's challenging to me to make my world look like that, to make sure I'm actively creating that. So thank you for what you put out. Oh my God, I love you guys. We love you, you so much. I love, love, love you guys. I am putting the Singers of Soul concert in the chat right now. Y'all go check it out. Diedrich, where do check they find out. you on the socials to follow your work? Um, um, just Diedrich Bonner on across all Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and then also Singers of Soul across all handles as well. Watch the concert and donate some money to them. They're hardworking yes. artists at home making concert for you. Okay, period. Oh my God, we lo love you guys. Thank you so love much for you. having me. Thank you, you so much on. for being here. Yes, ciao. He, he is a glorious man. I hope you all enjoy yes. that truly. Find his music, find Singers of Soul. Um, Blake, I want to say thank you to you for stepping oh, yeah. in and my hosting pleasure. the show with me. Um, and I didn't do the commercial in the middle, but y'all, we are doing this for fun. And But I definitely could use, if you've donated to all the causes and Singers of Soul and you want a tip because you enjoyed the show, you can tip on Venmo at Emerson Collins below or on PayPal to Beard Collins Shores Productions at gmail.com. Give them thank some money. Ah, Blake, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. This was a great time. I hope you all had fun. We hope the rest of your week is great. Keep your spirits up. 
and we will see you again soon. Bye. Bye.